Hello! Howdy. How is everybody? Uh, welcome to another channel update. It's been a while. It's been a long and strange and crazy road since the last update I did. I believe the last one I did, I was still actually living at home. Uh, that's one thing that's changed. I'm... I'm elsewhere now. Uh, it's fun, but it's... Scary. Adulting is hard, guys. But hey, welcome to the channel. Uh, welcome to all 200 of you, and thank you for being here. I, I I know where some of you came from. I was about to say I don't know where you all came from, but I know where some of you came from. And I'm happy that you're here. I'm happy that you're enjoying my stuff. I, I hope you're enjoying my stuff. Um, thanks to Couch Warrior for uh, agree- for- he's- he started it. <laughs> Thank, thanks to thanks to him for introducing to me the idea of doing a crossover between two characters that are like their universes aren't linked at all except through them. Uh, I hope that those of you who came here from his channel, excuse me, like Russell Dice on the desk. I hope that those of you who came here from his channel find my work to be at least. At least sort of on his level, maybe? I, I I aspire to Couch's level of awesome. Always. Uh it it's it's a fun it's a great time. I would be do <laughs> frankly I would be doing this if no one was watching, but like people are watching and that's awesome. And hi! Uh I'm EJ, welcome to the channel. This is what I actually sound like when I'm not voice acting for these characters. Um Actually, this is not what I normally sound like. I have been talking a lot at work, uh, and my voice is dead. So, yeah, just bear with me while my voice refuses to cooperate. What- what number is this channel update? I don't know. I don't know. I'm recording this, and I don't know when it'll go up. I'm thinking it'll go up after the next episode of Executioner, but I'm not sure. We will see. So. Um, the background footage that you're seeing, I haven't actually recorded yet, but I think is going to be some footage of a test character. I, well, I looked at the rules for the Character Crusade Unbound Season 4 challenge, and boy, howdy, I want to try it out, but I have no time. So whether or not this character ends up being played for more than one session, if I actually end up actually participating in this season remains to be seen, but I want to try out the rules anyway, and I have the must-make-a-new-character itch, so I am I will scratch it with this footage. And this, uh... <laughs> this is giving me a, a, an excuse to play a character that I don't have to record. Well, that I don't ever have to record a voice for, anyway. Not that I have any problem doing that. I quite like doing that, but the problem is that... Time. I need time that no one else is in the house for. I have actually recorded a couple of a couple of episodes with Brandon in the other room. He's my moose and I love him. He actually I'll get to that later. Anyway, so uh we already I already thanked all 200 of you for being here. Hi guys. Um I would like to thank Couch Warrior again because holy crap. <laughs> if not for him uh, my channel would have been growing much more slowly. I've- I've been active on the Character Crusade- well, active-ish. On the Character Crusade Discord for a while now. Uh, I have my own little section that I share with my mother of the Discord. That... didn't work. Anyway. Yep, I already thanked Couch, but I'm doing it again. Hi, guys! Uh, thank you, Couch. Uh, thanks to the Gentleman Bastards for putting together the Character Crusade community where I have met a lot of you lovely, lovely people, and where I tend to post when I put my videos up, because, yeah, I I actually don't update the fact that I've posted videos anywhere else, and I probably should, but that's, that's a decision for me to make another day. So, in honor, in light, in something, of the fact that I now have 200 of you in my humble kingdom, Kingdom? Sure. The I have 200 of you here now, which is a lot, and some of you are new and haven't been here 
from the beginning fumblings when I was still trying to figure out how this whole microphone audio production video stuff worked. When I was still getting my feet under me. Way back in the beginning. A year ago-ish. More than that. More than that? More than that. Ah! Um, I, wa I went through... I did this a while ago and I was going to do this in the last channel update I did. But I went through and collected a whole bunch of questions that I will now answer. Um, so basically this is a Q&A. So, yeah. 200 subscriber Q&A video. Uh, if you have more questions for me that I didn't answer, leave them in the comments of this video. I'll do another Q&A, maybe with the next update. Up update? Yeah, channel update. Duh. I was thinking Skyrim update and went, no. No. Please no. Um, anyway. Uh, right. I'll answer your questions, if you have them, in the next channel update. Probably. We'll see. I may wait for a while until I can just conglomerate a whole bunch of questions at the same time. So that, like, if somebody has a, uh, a question about one thing, I can just, like, direct them to this video. If I've answered it already. Or something. But yeah, I get a lot of questions. Some of them come up more than once and I answer them every time. I try to be good about answering comments. Sometimes I just leave a little heart because I love it when you guys comment. I, it, it, it makes me smile and giggle to see some of the reactions to things that I've done. My, my evil plotting comes to fruition, but that was none of the questions. Um, we will kick off this Q&A with a classic. Have you seen that Shrine of Azura? Yes. Yes, I have. I think all of my characters have, except for Mordgood at this point. Yes, I have seen the Shrine of Azura. Are all of your stories connected? Yes. Ingrath, Zaytest, Kinoa, Arden, Yarnvira, and now Mordgood are all part of the Dawnbreakers saga. All of their stories are intertwined. They're all part of the, sta the same timeline. I think the only characters who aren't actually connected in any way to this are the characters that I've played for Unbound. So Bargast, Solvander, Hegatha, and whoever this person ends up being. I haven't rolled anything for them yet. We'll see. Um, but all of the Unbound characters, potentially with the exception of Hegatha, I haven't decided yet, but all of them are part of this universe. Or, or, or all of the Unbound characters are not part of this universe, but Ingrath, Zaytest, Kinoa, Arden, Yarnvita, and Morgud are. They're... yeah. It started with just Kinoa, Arden, Yarnvita, and Zaytest, and then expanded. And it keeps expanding. Help. The universe is expanding. Do the characters have any rules about what they loot? And I can't remember who asked this question. I didn't actually list who asked any of these questions, so just bear with me, but this was an earlier on one. Do the characters have any rules about what they loot? Um, I know this question was mostly aimed at Kinoa, because she's a red guard and red guards have things about dead people. And I'll answer it for her first. She won't take anything from tombs and barrows unless it's directly from a body that gets up and attacks her. So like, if, if a body is laying on the ground, she probably won't loot it. I'm trying to be better about this because sometimes I, I forget that this is a thing that she's supposed to be doing. <laughs> uh, roleplay is hard, guys. Um, but yeah, most of the characters... She has the thing about dead people. Mordgood also has a thing about looting from dead people. She just... it. I'm not sure if it's a, a superstitious thing or a religious thing with her. She, it just squicks her out a little bit to, of the idea of like, Oh, hey, this potion is covered in blood. That's not great. But if it's from an ash spawn or something, it's like, I don't know how this ash spawn was carrying this potion, but I'll take it. Or if it's like laying around on a desk. It, yeah. I, I'm still trying to th sort out a bunch of stuff with Morgan as of this moment, but I'm working on it. I'm hoping that as uh, as Mordgood and Theral's relationship develop, develops, develops, uh, more of Mordgood's character will come to light. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff I'm trying to figure out with her, but um, as for the rest of the characters, most of them won't loot armor specifically unless they intend to modify it later. Like in one of the earlier episodes, Arden looted a. Uh, 
he looted a woman that was wearing chainmail armor because he knew he could modify the chainmail. He had he had the know-how. I don't know how he Oh, because his mother is a seamstress, duh. Um <laughs> forget about that. Uh or was a seamstress. But like he he picked up the armor and I kind of had this little roleplay moment of him trying to make sure the armor fit him and realizing that it fit him without <laughs> without him modifying it because she was a Nord and he's an Imperial and he's very skinny. So yeah, it probably wouldn't fit him nowadays, but anyway. They'll only take weapons that they think they can use, like Ingrath will pick up a bow if it's better than the one he has. Unless it's something really cool and looks like it might be important, like when Kinoa grabbed the whatever sword that was, the big two-hander that she will never use, but I, I don't know, Mordgood might at some point if they ever meet. Who knows? Um, Ingrath specifically doesn't really loot stuff anymore except for arrows. He's at that point where uh, he just doesn't carry a whole lot of stuff. It, it doesn't make much sense for him to carry a whole lot of stuff. Um, there's a lot of things about his character that don't make sense right now. For instance, why is it that a character who has never subscribed to the idea that Ifra is a good deity to follow. Why is it that he adheres to the Green Pact? What? Anyway, that's a question for another day because I still don't have an answer to that one besides just... Eh? That's how he was raised? Question mark? Um, so yeah. Uh, he does also craft his own arrows, uh, but prefers using arrows that can't be traced back to him. So in some instances, he will forego his hunter bone arrows, those those ones with the very specific feather pattern at the end, in favor of like Falmer arrows, for instance, or just straight up iron arrows because everyone uses those, and he just Bleh. you're dead. You can't track it. You can't track it back to me. Ha ha. ha. Um, I think all of my characters have rules about not taking food from necromancers, cultists, or bandits. Although the bandits one is a little meh. It depends on where they're hiding out, but like... Yeah, don't- uh, I have a rule for myself, which is don't take food from necromancers. I'm not sure if I will ever or have ever had a character who doesn't abide by that rule. I think Bargast may have been the only one, but I don't know. Um, Yarnvita, Ingrath... And they test all occasionally loot mead and ale from bodies, though. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's that's my loot rules. Kind of. They're not really rules, more guidelines at this point. I don't- I'm not great at abiding by my own character logic sometimes, and this is one of those times. How do these characters deal with all of the killing? And again, this was mainly aimed at Kinwa, but it applies to all of them. So, most of the characters were raised with martial backgrounds, in whole or in part. Uh, Yarnvita, being a skull, doesn't get squeamish about blood and guts. She used to hunt before she settled down to raise kids. And, you know, she she's a skull. She knows how to, like, skin a horker. Um, she did have that one freakout moment back in one of the... one of the chapters. I think chapter two? I don't know, but she did have that one moment where she freaked out about killing a guy, and then uh, that has been lingering in the back of her mind ever since, but she has... She doesn't get squeaked out by it anyway. She she She's not very squeamish because she's used to having to, like, skin horkers and butcher them, and that can't be... That cannot be a pleasant process. So, yeah, that's... She doesn't... The, the physical part, the actual blood and guts of killing people, she has no qualms about. It's when she stops to think about it that it's like, Oh, yeah, these people were someone's child. Or this person was someone's child, or brother, or sister, or something. And that's when she gets weird. But otherwise, if she doesn't think about it too hard, she can just wade into battle and out the other side and be fine. <laughs> Which... She's also a grandmother, so this is scary to me. Um... Other characters with martial backgrounds, Kinoa, her father was an Alakir, so she had a bit of combat training growing up. Uh, that and having to fight off bullies made her a bit tougher than she might otherwise appear to be. Um, she's always been very weird. She's always been a little bit 
off and not quite with it. Uh, and I imagine growing up in Sentinel was a bit difficult since she would have been pressured into passing for, I don't know, neurotypical, we'll say. Uh, she would have been like, okay, no, you can't act like that. You have to act like this because that's how proper red guards act. This is how we do things. And her parents were very much must enforce the stereotypes and the rules and the everything. So she grew up with that background. Uh, she has a lot of pent-up uh, aggression, I would say, toward her parents specifically and kind of her society in general. Uh, she has she has repressed or suppressed it very well, but I think I think the dragons are kind of making it difficult to continue that. So, uh, yeah. Zay Test is interesting. She was raised by a necromancer. She was not raised by a necromancer, but her mother is a necromancer. Uh, and she was unofficially adopted by a group of bandits later on. So killing in self-defense and even for survival isn't terribly foreign to her. Um, she hasn't had a whole lot of life so far. And... I'm not- I'm not entirely sure what her childhood back in elsewhere was like, except that she had a hyena skeleton as a pet for a long time. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that- she had a very, very interesting early childhood, and then, of course, being adopted, kind of, into this bandit clan, uh, and taught by Ingrath, actually. A lot of what she knows has instilled her with like, not necessarily a lack of care for who she kills, but it's it's one of those, like, I have to do this thing or I might not survive things. Uh, speaking of Ingrath, he grew up in the swamps of Valenwood, which, yeah. Um, and then he was groomed to be a Thalmor scout for most of his young life before he escaped and subsequently joined the Dark Brotherhood for a while. Uh, Long story. And then some bandits happened, and it, yeah, his story is long and difficult. So, moral of that story is that killing is his bread and butter. He's very good at it. He sees it as something of a creative challenge in a lot of ways, and doesn't hold too many lives in high regard in the first place. Given that he kind of, of his own volition, by the way, became a Hercene cultist when he was having his, shall we say, <laughs> teenage rebellion phase, yeah, he, he has the idea of the hunt instilled into, like, the fiber of his being. He- and the Thalmor really did affect him deeply in his- in the way that he holds lives to certain levels of- importance, I would say. Maybe not importance, but like, he- there are some people he does not care about, but if you're his family, he will do anything to protect you. That's- that's his thing. That's how he deals with the killing. He just- yeah. Arden is actually the one with the least martial background, but his studies in the College of Whispers subjected him to all kinds of ways that magic can and does go wrong. So death isn't terribly foreign to him. Uh, and I bring this up specifically because there was an episode in which, uh, it was the episode in which he first saw Helgen after it had been torched by Alduin. Uh, and he got very, very uncomfortable around all of the burnt bodies. He got very uncomfortable around all of the burnt bodies because he is a fire mage. And he knows he can do that. But he doesn't. You'll notice that when he kills people with runes, they overheat and die, but they don't burn to a crisp like dragon fire would do to a corpse. But I imagine somewhere in his past, he either watched that happen to somebody, or he did that to somebody. And I'm not entirely sure what the situation was. His College of Whispers days is still kind of foggy in my mind, and probably in his too. I mean, he was he was grieving for most of it because of stuff, but um, yeah, Arden 
Arden is a little bit darker than he lets on, I think. But at the like, he's seen some weird, crazy, bad stuff. But he tries not to let it get to him. But I don't think he does it in a healthy way. <laughs> that that will be explored uh, later when things get weird because that happens in Skyrim. Uh, no spoilers. We're moving on. Um, I have to add Mord Good on here because I didn't make any notes for her, but. She grew up in the Ashlands, uh, or she she was born in Cyrodiil to a pair of Ashlander refugees. They died, I'm not entirely sure how yet, but I know that they died and she was an or she was orphaned early on. Um, she was involved with a uh, later in life, she was involved with, or involved in a hostage situation involving the Thalmor at a, a wilderness hostel. Hostel, hostel, hostel. I, I don't know, but she was involved in the, in a hostage situation with the Thalmor. That's where she met Theral, and uh, I think that might also be where she met Hela and Balder, who are Yarnvita's daughter and son-in-law, respectively, and they adopted her and brought her to the Ashlands, which she had never seen before that point, and she sort of felt like she was coming home in a way, and then some things happened that I don't know how it happened, and uh, weird things uh, continue to happen with Mordgood that I will explore later and uh, let you know when I figure out what it was. Moving on. Could you see any of the characters settling down and adopting kids? And this was mostly aimed at Yarnvita, which I find funny because she does have family in Morrowind that she would visit if not for the fact that they're out in the Ashlands and tend to be hard to find, even by couriers. Mor uh, Morrowind is not- if, if if my estimations are correct, Morrowind is not exactly the friendliest place to be? But yeah, she has- she has had, uh, children. Uh, she lost two of them. Which is kind of what set her off in this big adventure in the first place. She kind of was like, Okay, well, I don't really have anything to stay here for. Two of my kids are dead and the other one's in Morrowind, so... The two of my kids are dead and one of them is in Tamriel's version of Hell, so I might just... I might as well just do something else. Uh, and she did. So, Mordgood is her uh, granddaughter, adopted granddaughter. But she completely approved and was was kind of like, I want to meet this small Dunmer grandchild of mine. I, yes, she's the granddaughter of my soul, and I accept her into my ranks, into our ranks. I don't know. So yeah, by the way, if Mordgood sometimes doesn't have the accent that you would expect her to have, it's because she was raised by two skull, or or a skull and a regular Nord. I don't I don't really know. Not important, but uh, yeah. That's why. And sometimes it's, uh, it's not her accent. <laughs> anyway, continuing. Uh, Kinoa and Zaytest and- well, okay. Kinoa, Zaytest, and Mordgood are all too young to think about children. Uh, Zaytest is younger than Kinoa by at least three years and she's a Khajiit. Um, I don't know how long Khajiit live. I'm going with the idea that if they do have long lives, they have short childhoods and then just kind of live for a while. Um, I, I don't know how beast folk work. And Mordgood, I believe, is the equivalent of like 13? Or 14? She sounds a lot more mature than she is because she's been through some stuff, but like... She's- she's the youngest now, even though chronologically she's, I think, older than Kinoa. I'm not sure. Um, Arden would have to adopt if he wanted to have a family. Because, you know, he's he's gay. Um, but he knows he can't raise kids on his own, and his track record, as far as relationships go, is not great. His ex is on Kano, so that should tell you something. It's, yeah, I, I don't really foresee him having children or, or adopting children in, in his future ever, but I don't know, that might change as his character develops in strange and unexpected ways. 
there's a lot of the story yet to be yet to be planned, yet to be played, and it could take all all manner of strange turns. Um Ingrath is certainly old enough for kids, even even being an elf. I believe his equivalent age is right around the same as Arden's. If 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 Arden were an elf or if Ingrath were uh, an imperial, they would be around the same age. Um, but given Ingrath's line of work, I don't think he'd want to. Uh, in a lot of ways, though, he has had he has helped raise kids before. Like, the idea of family to him is a very important concept. I'm not entirely sure where it came from, if it came from the Dark Brotherhood or if it if it is a thing that he carried with him from Valenwood, but all of the younger recruits in, in the Dark Brotherhood before it collapsed, all of the ones in Cyrodiil anyway, he was- he, he at least in part helped train them so like, uh, for instance, I mentioned in one of or uh, in one of his backstory vignettes, I did a call out to one of or, or a shout out, a callback, one of those things, to one of my mom's characters, uh, Vitas Perdetti, who Ingrath kind of helped train a little bit. He was sort of in the periphery while Vitas was young, and being uh, brought up in the Brotherhood. The timelines don't exactly match up there, but yeah, younger younger members of the Brotherhood he helped train a little bit when he wasn't going out and doing missions and, and killing people. And then with the Bandit Clan, um, I think the only the only really young enough person to be considered his kid was Zaytest. So. Uh, one of the things that comes up with him, and will continue to come up with him, is his relationship with Zaytest, and how... how he kind of refuses to admit that it's a little bit of a father-daughter relationship there. And that's something that I believe, don't quote me on this, maybe look forward to it, I don't know, I believe I might actually exp like start to try to explore that later on in the story, but I'm not sure if the gameplay will allow me to do that. We'll see. But it's there. He doesn't like to acknowledge it because he wants to keep her safe. And she... I don't... She didn't grow up with a dad, so she doesn't have anything to compare it to, so she's kind of oblivious on the whole matter. Uh, this started out talking about kids. I guess- I guess Zaytest is, in some ways, Ingrath's kid. So, you know. <laughs> she- he trained her. He- he taught her how to actually defend herself, so it- it counts. He- it counts in that way. Shorter question, was Yarnvita's ex-husband from Falskar? Yes, he was, and the idea of that actually came from my mom, who, uh, is 57 Strudel in the comments, by the way, if you didn't know. Um, she noticed that the accents in Falskar tended to be very similar to Brynjolf's accent, who she has also had canoned as someone from Falskar. Sorry if that's spoilers, Mom, but I think that- I think- I think that was a thing that came up very early in her story, though. Uh, I will- I will leave a link, by the way, to Walking from the Light in the description because I have given both her version of Brynjolf and Vitus, um, beautiful blue eyes per daddy in this video, uh, so I'll leave that in the description. But yeah, it's her fault, really. Uh, <laughs> I mostly just want Yarnvita to be able to recognize Brynjolf's accent if she ever meets him. It's more of an easter egg than anything, uh, but Mordgood does keep up with him. So I don't know what I'm doing with that yet, but I might do something with it. We'll see. Will Zaytest meet and or recruit Jazargo? Should she ever find herself in the College of Winterhold, she might. I was kind of toying with the idea of building an all-Khajiit team when she recruited Karjo, and then I couldn't get the horses and convenient horses set up the way I wanted. It turns out that your followers for convenient horses and amazing follower tweaks, they will not ride a horse unless you yourself 
are also on a horse. And that's a problem because the reason I wanted to get Karjo a horse was so that Zaytas could run and not have to keep turning around and waiting for Karjo to catch up. So she, uh, she dismissed him. So uh, Inigo will stay around for certain because he can use Frost no problem. But beyond that, I, I don't know. Why does Ingrath carry a Dawnguard axe? He stole it, A. Uh, I believe he took it from a body of a Dawnguard that he killed with his old axe, probably. Um, and he thinks of it kind of like a trophy, even though it's silver, probably, and would probably hurt a lot if he cut himself with it. Uh, it warns both the Dawnguard and other vampires not to screw with him. Uh, since he serves Harkon, d despite not being a vampire lord, I keep forgetting or, or neglecting to point this out at all, but Ingrath is not a vampire lord. You'll notice that every- I, I, I hesitate to say this because it will suspend the suspense of disbelief a little bit, but you'll notice that every time he walks up to Castle Volkahar in the Executioner series of videos, he doesn't ever go in to Castle Volgahar, and it's because he's not a vampire lord and uh, hasn't actually started that quest line yet. So, yeah. Uh, so Ingrath isn't a vampire lord, he's just a regular vampire. Uh, and because of that, because he does work for Harkon, he likes to and kind of has to remind the court. So, so pretend he actually can go in and and talk to the people uh, we are suspending disbelief again disbelief resuspended when he whenever he reports back in he obviously has to go into the castle so yeah we'll, we'll go with that um he likes to remind harkin's court that he is harkin's executioner and needs to be respected as such uh which i th i don't know if the court actually does yeah, but th th that's another- that's a story for another day, but that's why he carries the axe. It's- it's a warning, basically. People who recognize the symbol on it are either people that know he shouldn't have it, and therefore know he killed one of theirs to get it, or they recognize the symbol because it's one that they've seen in their face, probably, and they shouldn't- they shouldn't mess with him because, yeah, yeah, Ingrath has no qualms about killing stray random vampires. Speaking of which, who is Dominique? Dominique Gold is the vampire that turned Ingrath. I've written that story, I don't know if I've mentioned it anywhere in the videos, but it's probably background knowledge that will come out eventually. It's not very much of a spoiler at this point. Because it, it doesn't really have any bearing on the story, except that now you know why they know each other. Um, I have written the story of, uh, or, or the little vignette, of the situation in which she turned him. Uh, I haven't put it up anywhere yet. When I do, it'll be on my Patreon, along with the other backstory vignettes I've done. All of them, I think, save one. Excuse me. All of them save one are about Ingrath so far, and it's because he has the most backstory to write about. One of them was actually the, uh, the day that Ingrath met Zaytest, or Zaytest met Ingrath. It's actually from her point of view, not his. Um, so that's, that's there as well. I intend at some point to write, uh, backstory vignettes for, um, Yarnvita, Kinoa, Arden, Maybe not moored good, but someone connected to her. Maybe. I'm thinking about it. I don't know yet, but there will be more backstory vignettes on the Patreon, so there's a link to that in the description if you want to go check that out, if you want to support my channel, because that's a thing that people do. Back, back on topic, uh, the two of them Ingrath and Dominique have a long and complicated history. Mo I don't know much about her, except that she's kind of like if Maven 
actually was working with the underground and was more competent at her job and less of a mead baron. Dominique is terrifying to me because I know some things about her and I know who she knows and it's 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 really it's really e. <laughs> Most of what I know about her is that she was a source of information and trade for Ingrath and the Brazen Clan back in in the days when they operated out of Serpent's Den and weren't uh not in Serpent's Den or Serpent's Trail rather. Um, I don't know how the two of them, if she contacted them, or if they contacted her, or what. I have no idea how the two of them learned about each other, or why they started working together, but that's, that's, uh, that's how they, that's how that happened. And then some things went down, and, uh, yeah. Ingress a vampire now. Woohoo! Oh, and I don't think that Dominique is a vampire lord, either. I don't know, actually. I I think she might be in the in the version that I played so that I could make her face the way I wanted to, but uh, I don't know if she in the story is a vampire lord. <laughs> I, at this point, I'm not really sure if it matters, but if if anyone has ideas as to why that may or may not matter, leave them in the description be or in the comments because I am lost in that particular department. Woohoo! Um, Kinoa gets a lot of questions, which, I mean, is natural given who she is. <laughs> uh, but a couple of them that keep reappearing. Um, the, the ghost that keeps- uh, the ghost that keeps popping up, the ghost of her brother, uh, Chinutai, is voiced by Brandon, my beloved moose. Uh, and is an NPC of my own creation. He, I didn't grab him from anywhere. I made him... I made him who he is! And, uh, went through the complicated and strange process of trying to figure out how to make an NPC a ghost. Oi, it was... It was frustrating a little bit, but I, I got there eventually. And, uh, yeah, Brandon does his voice. Shout out to my boyfriend for being a good voice actor. Um, he's at work right now. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Kinoa, th this, uh, the bound bow thing. Uh, Kinoa being able to summon a bow came from her original, original, original concept. The thing that started this whole spiel to begin with. My, my test, my test version of Kinoa. Um, I don't know if I still have those videos up, but build test Kinoa. Uh, she had more archery skill than she does now. She was much more archery focused and less fo less focused on shield and spear. Um, I I liked shield and spear because she has reach for dragons now. Uh, anyway, I added the bound bow as a gift from Tava slash Kine slash Kinnereth, and a way for her to take down dragons because, as we know from Yarnvita, having no range when dragons are around is bad! It's not great! So, given that she, Kinoa, is the dragonborn, I knew she was going to be fighting, oh, the, uh, uh, a Salokneer, I think, is the first one that you fight? No, no, that's the one at Kynes Grove. I don't know what the one at the tower is, but she fighting- I knew she would be fighting that particular dragon and that she would need a way to take him down, and so I thought, hey, this would be an epic moment if she was fighting this dragon and then all of a sudden, boom, she just summons a bow out of the ether, given that the bow is sort of Kine's sacred weapon, if you will. So that's- that's where that came from. And I- I pretty much exclusively use that for dragons if and when I remember. Um, she hasn't really had a chance to think about why she can do that yet. She just can do it, and she does it in the moment when there's a dragon attacking, and then the dragon lands, the bow goes away, and she kills it, the danger is over, and that state of mind just sort of vanishes for a little while. So she hasn't really had a chance to think about it, but yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> that's where that came from. Is the This one's a more recent question. Is the Dawnbreaker Saga playlist chronological? Yes it is, or as close as I can get to it. Mordgood is the only ones- uh, Mordgood's series, by the way, is Book of Shadows. 
And it's the only one that's a bit off right now, since she's the newest addition to the plot and partially relies on what Couch Warrior is doing over in the Lorecon universe, which is where Theral is from. Uh, some of the videos early on in the playlist, not in Book of Shadows, um, uh, in the, in the in the Dawnbreaker saga complete play complete playlist. <laughs> oh jeez. Um, <laughs> pardon me while I model all over the place. Uh, some of the earlier videos have been taken out of the complete playlist because they didn't add a whole lot to the story, and uh, some of them were a little draggy, or or I was trying to get my feet under me still, like a lot. Uh, I think the first episode I ever did, the first of Arden's episodes. I took out of the playlist because I wasn't in character as him yet. And the second episode was when uh was when I was actually in character and and just in character the whole way through after that point. Uh I I figured I'd leave that one in because that's the one where he got the letter and so we know his name, he actually says it. I think you have the wrong Ardinius Welk. Um and then he he just keeps going in that voice forever and ever. And I, I, you know how hard it is to have voiced Mordgood for several hours on end and then try to switch to Arden's accent? Oh my god! Anyway, um, rant, rant over. Uh, if you don't want to spend a year and a half trying to catch up with the whole story so far, you can start from the Act 1 recap, which is admittedly a little bit cryptic. But it's a good jumping off point if you just want to know what is happening now. Uh, you can always go back and catch up or ask questions like... For instance, if you didn't know that Arden was gay and you're wondering why he has this beef with Ancano that's unexplained, it's explained back in the early the early of, of this, um, this experiment, the, the, the Dawnbreakers saga. And I, and I explain it here. I'm explaining it here. Yeah, Arden! Arden is gay, and he used to be in a relationship with Ancano back in his college days. There's a there's a backstory there. Um, it's uh, I'm uh, I get sad whenever I think about it. Moving on. Uh, last question: Who was that talking at the end of Book of Shadows entry three? Burned. And the answer is that is a secret. <laughs> I can tell the 57 strudel is out there facepalming right now. <laughs> so, with the Q&A finished, I would like to invite all of you, or as many of you as would like to comment, to ask questions down in the comments about uh, whatever you want, well, within reason. Um, for the next Q&A, whenever that ends up happening, I make no promises because time is of the essence and I have very little essence. Um, but I, I will answer questions again, eventually. I try to answer them in the comments as they appear, but sometimes I miss some. And um, sometimes YouTube doesn't alert me to the fact that I have comments that require moderation. And it's like, ah, why? Why do you do this? But, uh, yep, leave comments. Leave questions. I will, for the next Q and A, whenever that ends up being, I will just sift through all of the comments from this video to whenever the present is in the future. <laughs> made sense. <laughs> I hope that made sense. But I'll sift through all the comments, find questions, and start compiling a new Q and A document with notes and whatnot. And uh, yeah, if you would like to support the channel, you can always subscribe. You can always like stuff. Uh, you can leave me nice comments, or uh, perplexed comments, or uh, cringe, as one person did. <laughs> hi, cringe guy. I don't know if you're still watching. I assume not, but hi. Um, yeah, it was very cringe at the very beginning. It's gotten better since then. Uh, <laughs> I fully admit to this. But yeah, it, other ways you can support the channel. I, If you like... If you want to know more about Ingrath's backstory or, or Zaytest's backstory or more backstories in the future, uh, or if you want to support me monetarily, financially, uh, you can hop over to my Patreon. Everything on there is available for one dollar or more if you would like to donate more, but you only need to do a dollar a month and you get all the stuff that I've ever posted because I don't post a lot of stuff, so I feel weird 
saying, okay, you need... I, I feel weird having tears knowing how infrequently I post on Patreon, and it's because I'm too busy working on this. But, you know, someday, someday I will get there. Originally, Executioner was Patreon early. You could, you could see his episodes on Patreon before they went up. But uh, as he became more entwined with the plot, I had to undo that, so I'm still trying to figure out what else to do in the meantime besides write backstories, which... <laughs> time! Time! But! But! You can still support me, and I will still do things occasionally. Uh, yeah. That's there. Uh, that's linked in the description. I also, if you don't feel like doing a monthly thing, but you want to see what my writing is like anyway, you can always go to Amazon. Haha, -ha, here's a plot twist. I am also a fantasy novelist. I will link my website in the description so you can go see. There's an about me page if you want to go see more about me and how I got into writing specifically. Uh, but also my books are there. And you can download samples of all of them for free through Amazon if you would like. They're also on Kindle and Kindle Unlimited, so you can just read them on your phone or your computer or your Kindle if you have one. And I think only Asper's books are currently in paperback, but I'm trying to get the other ones formatted and <laughs> edited in some of places uh, for paperback. Uh, it's an ongoing process, but that's a thing that I do. And if you like my writing, then you can tell me, or not, or just enjoy it. I, I don't really I, I don't really mind if you just read it and enjoy it, or if you don't read it and enjoy this stuff, but don't really care to see what what my other stuff is about. But everything is fine. Everything is fine. Do what you will. I am here, and I will keep doing this. <laughs> So uh, I'm just happy to have y'all here. I'm, I'm happy to be making things that people enjoy in whatever form that takes. Uh, and I hope, I hope that you'll stick around as things get crazy in the Dawnbreakers saga and possibly beyond because I don't really know when the end of the Dawnbreakers saga will be. I know it's a ways off though. I'm pretty sure it's a ways off, but when I get there, I'm going to be very confused and, and don't know what to do with myself, but I hope you stick around, and I will see you in the next video. Have a good one.